go ahead and get started. I think I've worked out the technology, but it always seems to have some issues. Clickers, which we'll have in just a second, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, if you're not seeing scores and you think you have registered your clickers, um, please send me your name and the clicker number off the back of your clicker. So go to D2L, see if there are any scores showing up there. As of today, they actually start counting um, as far as the rest of the term is concerned. Um, I've got, I think, at least 10 clickers that are clicking away, but I don't know who you are. So be good to know that. Second thing is that I got the first sort of subject matter question today, actually over the weekend, about subunits versus domains, which I think was a great question. I posted it in the discussion section of D2L under questions. So uh, I strongly recommend taking a look there because I seriously doubt that that was the only person who had that particular question. So with that, um, any immediate questions now? I um, want to do a quick review on what we talked about last time and what we're going to continue to talk about today. We talked about amino acids. These are the monomers that get put together to form proteins or polypeptides. Got N termini, got C termini, each individual amino acid, and an extra side chain coming off the side. It's those side chains that are particularly different from all the other amino acids, but the backbone is exactly the same. That means that all the peptide bonds that form between the amino terminus and the carboxy terminus are going to be the same, and that's what links up your amino acids to make your polypeptide or protein. That's your primary structure. Secondary structures are the structures that form because of hydrogen bonds that form between the backbone atoms, so the nitrogens and the oxygens that are present on the backbone. Those are forming hydrogen bonds with each other. The two main secondary structures that are important for us and the most common are the ones of the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. Um, those, again, are forming by these hydrogen bonds. When you have these secondary structures, they'll come together to make tertiary structures. And this is the three-dimensional structure, the main three-dimensional structure. That's almost always going to be interactions of the, those individual side chains with each other, also known as protein folding. Um, once you have these structures, you have a structure, you have a function. Everyone needs more coffee this morning, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so the one, actually, the question that came up was, again, having to do with subunits versus domains. Uh, I wanted to spend a couple of seconds here repeating on the idea of domains. And a couple of you asked me after class last time as well. You can have proteins that just have one domain. You can have proteins that have lots of domains. And a domain is just defined by the fact that it's a contiguous stretch of sequence. So going from an N-terminal part of your protein to a C-terminal part of your protein. It could be the whole protein. Or it could just be part of the protein. That then has its own three-dimensional structure, which is a stable three-dimensional structure. And of course, that structure is going to have some kind of function. Again, you can have one protein, particularly stretch of amino acids. And I'll use, unfortunately, protein and polypeptides sometimes interchangeably because there are some proteins that have multiple subunits. So what the heck is a subunit versus a domain? So a subunit is going to be one polypeptide. It's got an end terminus, i.e. a beginning and an end, that then is together with other polypeptides in order to make a multimeric protein. And people call proteins can be a protein made up of a single polypeptide. Proteins can be made up of multiple polypeptides with multiple subunits. Kind of, sort of makes sense, kind of, sort of not makes sense. Yeah? So, the difference between a multimer and a polymer is that a multimer is multiple polymers? So, that one way of thinking about it, yeah, so a multimer versus a polymer. A polymer is going to be multiple monomers that come together, and so they're going to be, particularly if you've got the we're to, for this class, we're going to talk about nucleotides. We're going to talk about amino acids. That's going to be your polymer. Your multimer is then when multiple of those polymers, in the case of a multimeric protein, multiple of those polymers that come together. But the way that I like to think about it is that, certainly in terms of proteins, and actually also true for nucleic acids, you're going to have ends. And if you've got more than two ends, then it's going to be multimeric. 
It's another way of thinking about it. That make sense? Okay, we also talked briefly about protein families. Again, these are going to be homologous proteins. They could be parallel. Oh, sorry. Is there any difference between quaternary structure and multimers? So quaternary structure and multimers are um, just different ways of describing exactly the same thing. Uh, people all, pretty much always are going to talk, however, about quaternary structure when they talk about proteins. And we'll talk a little bit about multimers that could be, say, proteins and nucleic acid together. So in that case, you would not be talking about quaternary structure. No other questions? Yeah, so um, orthologs, paralogs. We had so much fun last lecture talking about orthologs and paralogs, so I went and looked it up again. Um, so <clears throat> one way that I like to think about orthologs and paralogs, orthologs, again, from the Greek, is ver how many of you have had Greek in school? I've had people in this class who have had Greek in, in class before. Actually, one of them corrected me once, which is rather embarrassing. Uh, <clears throat> Latin? So I've actually had four years of Latin in school, but I guess that's not happening too much anymore. Um, but yes, in the Greek, ortho is straight. And I like to think it's, it's going to be vertical descent, any kind of vertical descent, a straight process. Vertical descent is giving you multiple species. So orthologs are going to be in different species. Paralog, no, paranormal one way of thinking about it. It's going to be something which is beside, again, from the Greek. And beside is those two genes that are present in one organism. So hopefully that makes it a little bit easier to remember. Yes, no, eh. Um, they will reappear. <laughs> yeah, so orthologs are going to be in the different species because the vertical descent. And so vertical descent is you're going to be then diversifying into different species. So the orthologs are going to be then in the different species. The paralogs are going to be in the same species. And you can think of this being parallel in one of those specific species. Hopefully that helps. At least it helped me. What it helps you, I don't know. Okay, and then today we'll talk about allosteria and structural change and also talk a little bit about some of the protein methods which I usually talk about at the very end of the term, but they're far too important to talk about at the end of the term, so I'll talk about them now. Um, so since we're done with questions, though, what does that bring us to? Clicker questions. Great. So <clears throat> which of the following is the minimum percent amino acid sequence identity? Predict confidently the two proteins have similar structures, 15, 25, 35, 45, or 55. Stedman loves these kinds of questions because they're easy to come up with alternative answers for. And he hates coming up with alternative answers otherwise. What I'm thinking is maybe we should do 30 seconds for the first one, and then when you have your chat, then we'll have a uh, minute for the next one. Still trying to decide how to work that out. Again, our goal is 100% here. So um, I'll give you, I think this time we'll go about 30 seconds to discuss. We're close to 100% here. So let's, let's aim for the 100%. So what did you choose? Why? Tell your neighbors. Ready to go again? Yes. Go. <laughs> 
again, feel free to continue chatting. It's just, it's not to be completely quiet now. So. You have 45 more seconds. No more votes. In theory, there are 160 people registered for the class, so 45 of you are, oh, fewer of you came in. <clears throat> okay, so yes, it is 35. Um, 25 is a little too low, 15 is far too low, um, and any beyond that is more than you need. So um, important here, again, minimum percent amino acid sequence. Um, similar structures does not necessarily mean it's going to have exactly the same function, but likely to have very similar kinds of function. And this is why using computer analysis and finding similar sequences is such a useful thing to do. So <clears throat> with that, we'll <clears throat> oh, sorry. move on, talk a little bit about enzymes. This is not a biochemistry course, so we're not going to spend very long talking about them. But sort of the main take-home message here with this is that enzymes, this is actually true for most proteins, the vast majority of the amino acids are actually just to hold the important ones in the right place. So you can actually have a lot of variation in the number of amino acids. And that's probably why only 30% have to be identical to give you something even with a very similar kind of structure. So there's lots of different ways to metaphorically skin the cat here. So everything which is going to be gray on here, all of these gray amino acids are really not that important, other than holding where these colored amino acids are in the rest of the protein. And this is particularly well known for enzymes. This is an example here of an enzyme which is binding to cyclic AMP, and not even can't remember exactly which enzyme it is, but very few of these colored amino acids are the ones that are important. Everything else is just holding them in the right place. And so it's those critical individual amino acids which are going to give you the very specific different kind of function. And another way you can think about, again, these proteins being, in terms of their amino acid sequence, not that similar, or even one or two amino acid changes, could give you some kind of different specificity in terms of, say, exactly what product um, or substrate for your enzyme is actually going to be bound here. So that's one aspect about proteins that we should bear in mind. And again, we'll talk about different domains, different parts of proteins a little bit later on. It also makes predicting the structure of proteins really, really hard. Because if you have lots of parts of your protein, which can be not that critical, figuring out exactly how all of these really critical parts end up coming together is a very, very challenging process. And we still haven't quite figured out how to do that, even after years and years and lots and lots of people working on this particular problem. Another issue is that often there are different parts of proteins that are doing different things, and sometimes not even exactly the same thing. There's this process called allosteric regulation. And all that allosteric means is that something that's far away is causing a change in the structure somewhere else. And this could be you know, in general, you know, something that happens in you know, the bottom of your mountain will change what's happening at the top of your mountain. In this case, we're looking at enzymes. And it's that you have two different, in this case, binding sites for different ligands. And I haven't really talked about ligands before, but all ligand is is a small molecule that's going to interact with your protein. Um, the main ligands we'll talk about later in the class is going to be nucleic acids binding to proteins. So here, what we have is, I say R, I should say two different molecules, you know, molecule X and, in this case, glucose. Glucose is what's going to be acted upon by the enzyme, and molecule X, which actually has nothing to do with glucose in terms of its structure, 
is still going to modify how the enzyme is working. And it modifies it in some way by binding at one point in the protein, which changes what happens in another part of the protein. In terms of enzymes, you can have either those which are serving as positive regulators and also have those that serve as negative regulators. The only important thing here is you've got different binding sites, different parts of the protein that are changing the structure somewhere else in the protein. And this is just literally binding of two different molecules to your particular protein. We have other cases where we have changing structures that happen. And those are basically shown here, actually three different ones we're going to talk about today. The first one is <clears throat> the so-called protein kinases and protein phosphatases. These are adding phosphates. This is adding a covalent bond to your protein. And so the ligand binding, sorry, I should have mentioned here, it's almost always a non-covalent interaction. But phosphorylation is a covalent interaction which takes place. In order to have these covalent interactions take place, you, of course, have to have coupled intermediates, so high energy intermediates, and then enzymes that are involved in the process. So making this phosphate, adding it to the protein, are going to be protein kinases. Taking the phosphate off are protein phosphatases. I like to think about these processes of phosphorylation really kind of like switches in terms of what happens to the protein. When you have a phosphate on your protein, that's going to change the structure of your protein. It's supposed to be this little blob right here. You take the phosphate off the protein, that blob disappears, and you go back here. But again, since this is a covalent interaction, this is actually very stable and can last really for quite a long period of time inside the cell. On the other hand, we've got another whole class of signaling proteins usually go by the name of G protein or GTP binding protein. These now interact non-covalently with guanosine tetraphosphate, GTP. And then when they're bound to this with an allosteric kind of interaction, you have a change in the rest of the protein, and this gives you some kind of signal. These little red arrows that you'll see throughout the textbook and a bunch of slides, all this means is a signal that's happening. Usually this kind of signal is going to be interaction with some other kind of protein. As soon as you have hydrolysis of this high energy phosphate in your adenosine triphosphate, changes the structure. You go back now usually to an inactive structure here. This guanosine diphosphate, GDP, needs to be taken off. And actually, the taking off step is usually one of the slowest steps that happens in this process. You put on GTP, and this process continues. This hydrolysis process, you know, GTP going to GDP, is that energetically favorable or energetically unfavorable? So what happens? You're increasing entropy. It's a very favorable reaction. So ATP to ADP, favorable reaction. GTP to GDP, favorable reaction. So this process right here is a spontaneous process. So instead of being really stable here, because you have a covalent bond, this is a much less stable process. And this, I like to think of much more as a timer. And we'll look at these in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides. First one here, protein kinases. All that a protein kinase does is it takes the phosphate off of ATP and puts it onto an OH hanging off of a protein. These OHs are usually going to be serines, threonines, or tyrosines. And we'll talk about those later. Again, I don't expect you to remember all of those, but these are the amino acids which have those OHs on their side chains. Again, this is a covalent bond which is formed. Move this out of the way. <clears throat> and is then stable until you have a protein phosphatase, which will 
get rid of this phosphate, and then you go back to having an OH on the side of your protein. Again, usually this is going to be some kind of inactive protein that gets activated by phosphorylation. And again, all this phosphorylation is happening with kinases. Anytime you see ACE, ACE is kind of telling you that it's an enzyme. Usually what enzymes do is they help break bonds. So phosphatase, what does it do? Cuts off phosphates. So kinases, unfortunately you need to remember that. It's that it's putting on phosphates. In some cases, you'll have the phosphorylated form of the protein, which is inactive, and the non-phosphorylated form, which is active. You know, varies, but in the majority of times, this is what's happening. There's a stretch in the back or a question? Stretch, cool. OK, so that's, that's our kinases and phosphatases. If you want to know more about kinases and phosphatases, take cell biology. Um, some of you, I think, already are. Um, spend inordinate amounts of time, as far as I'm concerned, talking about kinases and phosphatases, because they're very, very important for cell signaling reactions. <coughs> Probably the second most important in terms of cell signaling are these G proteins or GTPases. Again, these are allosteric proteins where you have binding by GTP to a protein. This particular protein is the RAS protein. It's mutated, I think, in something like 60 to 70% of solid tumors. And that mutation actually causes the protein to look as if it's bound to GTP even when it isn't. Um, and when I say look as if, that means it's got this change in structure. And it's literally this piece of the structure right here, this red helix um, together with the turn right in front of it, which changes in terms of its structure if you have three phosphates here or just two phosphates here. So hydrolysis of GTP, this folds together. If it's bound to GTP, that pushes this helix out and then interacts with other things. And as I mentioned before, at the bottom, we've got GTP bound, which is almost always going to be active. Hydrolysis, this happens with some period of time. It will happen spontaneously. It can be speeded up by proteins, which are GTP activating proteins. GDP change the structure, is now non-active. Getting GDP off, again, almost always the slow step here. There's something called a gap protein, a <clears throat> guanosine nucleotide exchange pro uh, protein. That's what's making this exchange take place. Once you have non-bound protein, this actually will bind, there's any GTP around very quickly, and reactivate itself. So this can happen, again, completely in the absence of any other proteins. It just gets regulated in terms of its speed by the extra proteins which are around. So that's the majority of these signaling proteins that we have inside the cell. There's one other set that I wanted to talk about, and these are the ubiquitination enzymes. This is actually kind of a combination, to some extent, between the two. Also, covalent changes that take place on a protein, but it's not just a phosphate. And sort of to back up a little bit, why phosphate? Phosphate's great because it's got lots of negative charge. And a lot of negative charge that comes in a small package, as soon as you have a negative charge in the outside of your protein, it's going to change the way that all the rest of the protein pieces are going to interact with each other. On the other hand, <clears throat> this covalent interaction, ubiquitination, this is a protein, relatively small protein, about 100 amino acids, actually slightly less than that. Ubiquitous, surprise, surprise, with the name ubiquitin, uh, and extremely well conserved. Organisms that have ubiquitin in them, that ubiquitin protein is almost identical in its sequence. So <clears throat> what is ubiquitin doing? Ubiquitin is actually used for a whole bunch of different things, signaling, Turning proteins on, turning proteins off. And again, not surprisingly, it's going to be those interactions that change. You add this extra 100 amino acids in the outside of your protein, it's going to change what it's going to be interacting with. So it's important for signaling processes. We know it best to, because it's involved in protein degradation processes. And so that's the main thing that we're looking at here. So how do you get this protein bound? Now, the getting phosphates is easy because you've got ATP. That last phosphate comes off, gets put onto a protein. What about the case with ubiquitin? 
So it turns out for ubiquitination, you need three proteins, ridiculously creatively named, molecular biologists are highly creative, E1, E2, and E3. Uh, OK, so E1 is known as the ubiquitin activating enzyme. Basically, all that it does is it forms an active intermediate. Again, we already talked about active intermediates. What it does, it takes the energy from ATP and hooks ubiquitin onto E1. Once E1 has ubiquitin on it, it binds to E2. E2 is going to be the protein which is going to add the ubiquitin to whatever protein it needs to be added to. This is this green protein down here. Um, these are actually really very general because, again, ubiquitin is ubiquitous, very similar sequences. E2, all it's doing is taking this activated ubiquitin from E1. Now it needs to put it onto a protein that needs to have ubiquitin on it. That's where you get the specificity from. That's what this E3 protein is, also known as ubiquitin ligase. So ubiquitin ligase is going to give you the specificity. In this case, it's binding to this green part of this green protein. If it's bound to this protein, then ubiquitin will get put onto a NH2 group. You'll notice this NH2 group is not hanging out at the end of the protein. It's an NH2 group that is hanging out in the middle of the protein. Anybody remember what NH2 parts are usually part of? Yeah, and also <coughs> lysines have um, NH2 groups as well. It's usually going to be lysines which are going to be added to ubiquitin. So, but you can get them also to these, the other ones, but it's usually going to be a lysine. Um, and then what happens in the case of proteins that are going to get deg degraded is this first ubiquitin gets added, but then E2 continues to add lots and lots of ubiquitins to this protein, and that I like to call it the eat me signal. Um, these polyubiquitins get this protein and move it to the proteasome, which is the molecular garbage disposal inside the cell. We'll chop up the protein into individual amino acids so they can be recycled and reused. So again, this multiple different processes here, signaling and degradation, but again, a covalent bond and a covalent change that happens to the protein. Part of the reason we spend a lot of time talking about this is this is actually the area of Dr. Jeff Singer's research. And any of you who've had Dr. Singer, um, you'll hear much, much more about <coughs> these kinds of processes. And one of the things that <coughs> he specifically works on is this protein here called Cullen, um, which is part of E3 ubiquitin ligases. And there's, I say part of E3 ubiquitin ligases is also a nice example of a multimeric protein. So multiple polypeptides that come together in order to give you a particular function. Um, the Cullen protein itself serves as a scaffold. And it turns out that there are lots and lots of proteins inside the cell that are scaffolding proteins. And all that a scaffolding protein does is interact with other proteins. Um, and in this particular case, the Cullen proteins interact with some substrate binding proteins. And these are actually two different examples of substrate binding proteins here. This is now what's going to give you your specificity to look at ubiquitin ligase to whatever protein it's going to interact with. It also needs to interact with the E2 proteins, which are these ubiquitin conjugating enzymes. And they also have separate polypeptides, these two adapter proteins as well. This whole complex will bind to target protein. Then that protein will become ubiquitinated. This ubiquitinated protein then, in this case polyubiquitinated, will end up being degraded um, inside the cell. It's particularly important for the cell cycle. Again, the subject of cell biology to a great extent. So that's all I wanted to talk about from the point of view of proteins specifically. We'll get back and talk more about you know, DNA binding proteins, proteins that do specific things later on in the class. But that's sort of the, the big overview of proteins. And today, again, we mostly covered um, these last two steps here, allosteric and structural changes. More questions about proteins before I ask you one. OK. Which of the following is most like a timer in molecular biology? Protein kinase, protein phosphatase, G protein, E2 protein, E3 protein. Uh, 
we get more than 80%, we can move on immediately after this. So we're not at above 80%, so go ahead and tell your neighbors why you cho chose what and why. Sorry, what you chose and why. Ready to go again? No? <laughs> yes? <laughs> Maybe? OK, let's do it. Again, you can continue to discuss this. It's only the last click that counts. I can even give you a countdown if you like how much longer you have. Other classes will like that. Three, two, one. Ding, ding. We improved, yes. So um, the second most popular, and this was considerably more popular last time, was protein phosphatase um, versus um, protein kinases. People didn't like that very much. But the idea, and maybe I didn't get this across properly, is that <clears throat> Kinases and phosphatases and phosphorylation in general, and also true for ubiquitination, is really like a switch because as soon as you have a covalent bond, it's a much, much more stable process. So you can also think of the protein kinase as being an on switch and a protein phosphatase as being an off switch, but not thinking about it as a timer. GTPases, once they're bound to GTP, there will be hydrolysis of GTP to GDP. And so how fast that goes. That's how long you're going to have before you have a change in the structure. Yeah. Question. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Other questions, comments, concerns, worries? OK, so now we'll <clears throat> switch gears, talk about protein methods. Oh, hang on, let me hide this. Make sure we got the right answer. Talk a little bit about some protein methods. Um, these are the kinds of things that we do in my lab and pretty much any molecular biology lab, cell biology lab, you name it, very, very frequently. So one of the very first things that you do and you want to do is separate the bits and pieces of your cells from each other. And to do that, centrifugation is an absolutely critical step. So just literally spinning stuff. And we'll talk about some of the ways you do that in a second. 
Chromatography. Um, chromatography, hopefully some of you heard about in chemistry, literating, literally separating colors. Um, but in this case, we're separating proteins. And what this process does is it separates proteins dependent on some of their properties. And literally, those properties are going to be whatever's on the outside of that particular protein or whatever it's going to be actually binding to. Tags, this is a much more modern approach. Very often, the protein that you're trying to work with doesn't have the right kind of thing on the outside that makes it easy to separate from all of the other proteins. Um, and if you can use the magic of recombinant DNA technology, then you can add a specific thing to the outside of your protein. And once you've done that, then you can use that to pull it away from everything else. SCS page, everybody uses this acronym, sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Um, it's just a way of separating proteins based on their relative molecular mass. And we'll talk about that again. It's a very, very common process that's used in pretty much any kind of protein analysis. Mass spectrometry, this is the latest, greatest technique. And again, you know, could be a whole course in and of itself. This gives you the exact mass of your protein, or usually it's going to be pieces of your protein. And since these mass spectrometers have gotten so good and so precise in terms of the masses that they give you, you can use mass spectrometry, and pretty much everybody does these days, to definitively identify whatever protein it is that you're looking at. And so, for instance, in our lab, when we think we've purified a protein and we're really happy with it, we see a nice band on SDS page and go, wow, that's what we want. Then we'll do mass spectrometry to make sure that's actually really what we think it is. Um, so <clears throat> that gives you molecular masses, identifications. In terms of the structures, like these pretty structures we just saw a second ago, um, there are basically two ways to do actually three ways these days now to do that. Um, nuclear magnetic <coughs> resonance spectroscopy, X-ray crystallography, and now more and more um, electron microscopy, cryo-electron microscopy for figuring out the molecular structure, actually at almost atomic detail of some of these structures. And again, the things we've looked at already, and we'll look at a lot more um, throughout the rest of the course. Why should we care? Because everything that's in the textbook comes from these techniques that we've talked about. So <clears throat> oh, this is a separate way of looking at things. STS page, um, sodium dodecyl sulfate, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, um, three flavors of centrifugation. We've got preparative centrifugation. Excuse me here. Uh, get this thing to work. Here we are. Preventive centrifugation, this is just separating the different pieces of your cell from each other. And then two different analytical ways of doing centrifugation in terms of size and in terms of density. And we'll look at those in just a second. Chromatography, as I mentioned before, this is going to be separating proteins from all the other proteins due to some aspect of that particular protein. Whatever the charge is on the outside of that protein, ion exchange, the size of your protein, this is gel filtration, or something that that protein happens to bind to, affinity chromatography. A little bit about proteomics. Proteomics, one of my good friends, a guy who's a professor at UC Davis, um, keeps a list of all the bad uses of omics um, because it's gotten way out of control. Uh, but proteomics, pretty generally used, is looking at all of the proteins in a cell at one given time. And this is really kind of different than what we talked about last time. How do you figure out what it is that the gene does? You do genetics, knock out the gene, see what happens. Or by chemistry, look at one particular protein and see what it does, and then try and integrate these things with each other. Well, the idea of proteomics, and to some extent of genomics, is looking at all of the proteins all at the same time, and then trying to get an idea what they're doing. This is much, much, much more complicated. but it's a very powerful technique because you're literally looking at all the proteins at one particular time. How do you do that? Used to be people always used to use the so-called two-dimensional gel electrophoresis, which is partly SDS page and partly isoelectric focusing. We'll talk about that in just a second. Now pretty much everybody is doing mass spectrometry because the mass spectrometers have gotten so much better. Uh, major uh, techniques, again, of getting structures, X-ray crystallography and NMR spectroscopy. I should have a section. and. We don't get to it today. Maybe I'll add one next time um, on <clears throat> cryo-electron microscopy because 
That's what everybody's doing these days. And we've actually got a really nice group here in the chemistry department. Steve Reichow, any of you know Steve Reichow? I had him as a class. Uh, he does uh, <clears throat> see, excuse me, cryo-electron microscopy and has, has solved the structures of some really amazing proteins, membrane proteins in particular, and just had a publication in Nature I think a couple weeks ago. Um, then <clears throat> also, can we talk a little bit about bioinformatics? Again, Stedman has in quotes because, again, a whole course in and of itself. And in fact, we do offer a course. Dr. Raghavan in biology offers a course in bioinformatics. And then um, one other thing that's sort of mentioned, we talked about these kinases, phosphatases, G proteins. They're usually involved in interacting with other proteins. Well, how do we know how they interact with other proteins? So um, spend a little while talking about some of those techniques um, right at the you know, either end of today or next time. But let's start with gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis is a really standard technique that is used actually both for nucleic acids and for proteins. And the whole idea is here is that all you want to do is separate whatever you start with. We have up here at the top whatever's in here from the other things. And the way you do that separation is by putting your mixture at the top here and then in an electric field, allow it to migrate, in this case, from, from negative charge to a positive. So, <clears throat> and this will separate relative to both charge and size. And the reason it separates based on size is this gel here is basically a matrix with lots of little holes in it. And the bigger the thing you have, the slower it's going to be able to go through those holes. So this is great, and it actually is used for proteins um, quite a lot. But as we've talked about before, depending on what amino acid side chains you have on the outside of your protein, it's going to have different charge. And what would be really useful is to somehow separate proteins just based on their mass rather than their mass and their charge. And the way that that happens is you need to solubilize your proteins and get them so that they are not globular, i.e. all folded up together, all stretched out. You do that in two ways. The first one is to treat your protein with beta mercaptoethanol or some kind of reducing agent. Why do we use this? Well, if you've got disulfide bonds that have formed between cysteine residues, we talked about those last time, those are going to be holding your protein, or maybe even two different subunits together in your protein. And that's going to not allow you to figure out what the relative mass is, because you're going to have these things that are stuck together. They're not going to be all in, stretched out, basically looking at like primary protein structure. When you get relative masses, primary structure is the way to do that. So that's the first thing. The second one is we looked also, again, these, you know, Side chains, we've got polar side chains, we've got nonpolar side chains. The nonpolar side chains are those hydrophobic side chains. They like to interact with each other. They're usually stuck on the inside of a protein. Um, they're the oily parts of the protein. So if you've got this compacted protein, you're really interested in making it a linear protein so you can separate it, again, based on molecular mass. You need to get rid of all those interactions. The way that that happens is with the detergent exactly like what you do when you're hopefully washing dishes, um, is you put in a detergent. What does it do? It breaks up all of the greasy stuff. Breaking up the greasy stuff is just like breaking up all of these hydrophobic in um, interactions. How do you do that? Any detergent, but the major detergent that is used in these gels is sodium dodecyl sulfate. Um, has this long hydrophobic chain and a charge at the end of it. So hydrophobic to break things up and gives you charge. Another nice thing about adding charge to your protein is if your protein is otherwise not going to be soluble, not going to be able to be in liquid, it's going to be really hard to look at in one of these gels. So solubilization as well as giving you a charge is what you get from detergents. The other thing that happens in STS page is you heat up your protein. In heating up the protein, that pulls it apart, allows the detergent to bind and this is then the process that you get for SDS page. So SDS page again, sodium dodecyl sulfate and your reducing agent. 
you heat up your protein, and then you put it on the gel. The gel is a polyacrylamide gel. That's what the PA stands for, um, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So it separates based on size. You have your proteins. Could be a single subunit protein. Could be a multiple subunit protein, in this case with a disulfide bound. Heat it up with FDS and a reducing agent. Now you end up with two bands. We've got a large protein here, small protein here, large one here, small one here. Single protein ends up here in the middle. So these are separating based on relative molecular masses, and it's an incredibly useful technique. It's also really easy to do. Well, if you ask my students, they might not quite agree that it's completely easy, but <clears throat> be that as it may, the next thing that you have to do is somehow you need to visualize these proteins, because usually proteins don't have color. Sometimes they will, but usually in the denaturation process, you're going to lose whatever kind of chromophore they have bound to them. So you also have to stain your proteins, and the staining process that is usually used, these are often stains that were originally used for clothes. So Kumasi Blue um, is the standard stain for proteins. It's also originally used for, for staining clothes, but it, gives, it allows you to visualize where these prote proteins are relative to each other. And we'll see an example of STS page a little bit later on. So this separates your proteins um, with your relative molecular masses. So how do you get these proteins in the first place? Usually you have a cell, you have an organism. Um, it's all these things mixed together. And we're moving down this biochemistry track here. We're trying to separate out the proteins. So how do we separate different proteins? This class, we're going to be very interested in what's happening in nuclei, because that's where all of the exciting nucleic acids are, at least to start with when we'll we're talking about the DNA. Um, also, you can use these kinds of centrifugation processes to separate the most important things on our planet, which, of course, are these guys right here. Uh, <clears throat> but ribosomes and, and all, anything that's inside a cell, you want to be able to separate it from other things. Centrifugation is almost always the very first step that you do. And one thing it does is actually concentrates all of the things that you're looking for as well. So <clears throat> usually you'll take a cell, you'll break it apart, and then you end up with a whole mixture of different things. And so here's our mixture, big green dots, little blue dots, little black dots. And in a relatively low speed centrifugation, you get all of the really big heavy stuff. And just by spinning, you end up here with a separation. The faster you spin, the smaller things you're going to have ending up down here at the bottom of your centrifuge tube. And if you remove what's on top each time, you can now get a separation through this whole process. This is our differential or preparative centrifugation. Um, they have a, I like this image here from the textbook where we have, this, by the way, is now chapter 8. So if people are looking, um, we are skipping ahead relative to the, the book, but I think it's useful to do this. Here is a classic centrifuge. These rotors are usually either metal, titanium, carbon fiber. In some cases, you spin them up to 100,000 RPM. Um, in any of these good centrifuges, you also have an armored chamber around the outside. It makes centrifuges really heavy, but if you have something that's spinning at 100,000 RPM, large piece of titanium, you don't want it to go anywhere else. Um, and in fact, these are very heavy centrifuges for exactly that reason. If you want to see some scary things, go look on YouTube for centrifuge um, accidents. They're, they are pretty scary. And this is actually one of the things that scares me the most in the lab is when we have our ultra centrifuge running. Um, usually about 30,000 RPM, but that's about 400,000 times G. So this is your preparative centrifugation, usually relatively large volumes. But you can also use centrifugation for analytical purposes. And this is um, another way of looking at things. When we talk about ribosomes later on, and we already talked about that really well-conserved molecule that we use for making all of these trees of all the different domains of life, the 16S molecule. That S is the Svedberg. Um, and that comes from centrifugation. And that centrifugation says this has a relative size. And so if you want to get these different sizes, there are basically two different ways of doing that. But the main one, particularly in terms of Svedberg's convenience, also sedimentation. And so the way that you do this 
is you have a centrifuge tube with, in this case, sucrose or some other kind of gradient down at the bottom here. Put your sample at the top and spin it. This is actually not unlike a gel, where you've got different sizes, in this case it's a different density of holes that you're separating things through. In this case, it's a gradient of increasing density of usually sucrose. As this spins, they'll have fast sedimenting components, which are the small ones, and slow sedimenting components, which are the big ones. After a certain period of time, you stop your centrifuge, you make a little hole in the bottom of your centrifuge tube, and start to collect drops. The first drops are going to be the ones over here. So this is going to be the bottom of your tube. The next drops are here. The next drops are here, which is where you have your fat sedimenting component. You have some drops that have nothing in them, and eventually you'll get to your slow sedimenting component as well. And now by just looking at what's in each of the tubes, say for instance by SDS page electrophoresis, you can get an indication of what's a slow sedimenting or a fast sedimenting component. So this is a sedimentation velocity experiment. Again, gives you size. Another technique which also uses centrifugation is what's called equilibrium centrifugation. And we'll look at this. This is the most beautiful experiment in biology. At least some people have called it that. Using equilibrium centrifugation. So equilibrium centrifugation depends on having a gradient of usually cesium chloride in a particular sample. Now this sample is mixed in completely in this gradient. You put it into a centrifuge, and in this case, again, usually hundreds of thousands times the force of gravity, force due to gravity, and eventually what will happen is this will separate based on density. There's now a density gradient that's supposed to be shown by the dark blue at the bottom and the light blue at the top. And then each of the different components will eventually get to an equilibrium point where the density of the gradient and the density of whatever you're looking for, be it red or be it black, um, will be where it ends up in your centrifuge tube. We use this to purify viruses all the time. Um, it was also originally used to purify DNA. And again, we'll look at it when we talk about DNA replication um, a little bit later on. So this is can be used preparatively, but also um, very often is used in an analytical way. What's the density of whatever thing it is that you're looking for? Um, red here, for instance, is a particular density. The neat thing is that density now you can take out that sample, again, usually through this kind of fractionation process like we have here on the side, and say, oh, this fraction has a density of 1.3 grams per milliliter, for instance. And that tells you what the density is of whatever component you happen to have in there. And we happen to know our viruses have a density of 1.34 um, grams per milliliter. So find something that's 1.34 grams per milliliter, that's where our viruses should be, relative to all the other components, which usually have different densities. So separation based on size, separation based on density, how else can we separate proteins? Well, we can separate them based on other kinds of characteristics, particularly the outside of the protein. So the way that this is done is almost always on a column. And again, I should have brought some props for this lecture. Um, this is literally a cylinder where you put stuff at the top. You let it flow through this cylinder. In the cylinder, you have a particular matrix. That matrix will slow down some of the things that you put on top, and it should slow them down in separate ways. And so here's this sample you put on the top. You now let your sample move through the column, and hopefully the green will get separated from the red because the red is interacting less with the matrix than the green is interacting with the matrix. And eventually, when you get to the bottom, these things are all flowing through this column, through the matrix. The red comes out first, and the green comes out later. What's in the matrix? That's the key to any of these chromatography steps. 
You can do an ion exchange matrix. We'll take a look at what those look like in just a second. That's going to be charge. Based on the charge of your protein, it's going to be those charged amino acids, which are the lysines, arginines, glutamates, and aspartates on the outside of your protein, um, plus whatever else is there, but usually it's going to be those, and exactly how they're interacting with other ions. You can also have what's called a hydrophobic interaction column, where you look at how much hydrophobicity is exposed on the outside of your protein. More hydrophobic is going to be maintained more, less hydrophobic is going to be maintained less. You can also have gel filtration columns. Literally all this is is separation based on size. Separation based on size should sound really familiar now. We had SDS page, we have <coughs> sedimentation, um, excuse me, centrifugation, and also on these columns. Nice thing about gel filtration is a very fine kind of separation that you can get there. And then affinity is one specific thing that things bind to. And we'll look at examples of all of these in the next couple of minutes. Then you're going to collect across the bottom. Again, just like we had with the centrifugation. First things that come off that says nothing in it, nothing in it. Eventually the red thing that you're looking for and the green thing that it looks for. Let's look at some of these matrices, what's in each of those columns. Ion exchange, also IEX. Um, these are going to have either stably positively charged or stably negatively charged parts of your matrix. So if you have your <clears throat> different proteins that are coming through here, either negatively charged or positively charged, as they're going past the matrix, anything which is negative is going to get slowed down because it's interacting with these positively charged beads. Anything which is positively charged is not going to interact, so it's going to go through more quickly. Ion exchange is great because what you can do is once you have an interaction between your protein, the particular charge, again negatively charged here and the positively charged, now you can increase the amount of some kind of salt that you add to this. In this case, it could be something like sodium chloride. And what happens is those ions, the chloride ions, will exchange with your protein ions around. Call a 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 call